let's talk about safety. The particular standard that we're looking at is the lockout tagout standard 29 CFR 1910.147. Why is safety important? Well, here's a cartoon from the far side where the skyscraper has fallen over, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's fallen and it's landed on someone's head, and the boss says, and that, Arnie, is why we wear hard hats on the job. Obviously, a hard hat wouldn't protect him, but that's part of the joke. And if you like far side, he's, he's kind of like this, where his name's Gary Larson, and uh, things are just over-the-top ridiculous, and it can be quite funny. So why is safety important? Well, because accidents do happen, and that's what this illustrates. Accidents are going to happen, and that's the reason that safety is important. Now, why do you put on your seatbelt when you go down the road? Are you planning to have a wreck? Obviously not, right? You're going down the road thinking that everything is going to be okay, but you put your seatbelt on just in case, just like you put on your hard hat just in case. So what's the common denominator in accidents? Well, let's think for a minute. In this class, we're going to program PLCs, and PLCs control big machines, potentially, sometimes small machines, but often large machines. Here's a large machine. It's a rock crusher. It works fairly simply, and it was invented fairly recently, at least this particular style. The whole idea is that you build up some rocks around the periphery. There's a rotating drum, and as rocks come in and they're slung out, and basically you have rock hitting rock, and so the rocks decimate themselves. They break each other up rather than there being you know, steel or some wear surface that is used to break up the rocks. They were invented, or this particular design was invented by uh, Bartley and McDonald. You can see a picture of them here. I think it was back in the 60s, something like that. This type of rock crusher is called a Barmac rock crusher, using the first few letters of both people's last names put together. So what is the common denominator in all accidents? It is that energy is misdirected. So why are we talking about this in a PLC programming class? Well, the purpose of a PLC is often essentially to direct energy at the right time, to make things happen, to turn motors on and off, to open and close valves, to activate solenoids and air valves and things, all at the right time. And often a PLC controls a fairly large system and directs energy. And if energy is misdirected, that's what we call an accident. If you get in your car and you're going down the road and you get in an accident, you have a wreck, what does that mean? Well, energy is misdirected to your body. That energy, that kinetic energy, should just be used to cut through the air and get to where you're going, right? But if you come to a sudden stop, obviously there's energy, the kinetic energy you had that the car no longer has because it's essentially stopped once it's wrecked where you smack into the car and that energy then is redirected from kinetic energy into something that breaks bones or worse. So the, the common denominator in all accidents is that energy is misdirected. These are the, the big ones. So how do we prevent energy from being misdirected? Well one of the common times when energy is misdirected is when maintenance is being performed on machinery. And so a the, the standard we're talking about uh, addresses something called lockout. And the idea of lockout is that there's some uh, mechanical means of isolating energy and preventing energy from getting into the machine being serviced. So here you see Homer Simpson. He's hot and he wants to turn the fan switch on, but one of his coworkers is maintaining the fan, maybe fixing a belt, tightening up a belt, or checking the balance on the blades or something. And that worker has his lock on the switch so that the switch cannot be thrown. So the padlock is the common type of energy isolation device, but the equipment have to, has to have some uh, accommodation for it, some place to put it where putting that padlock on causes energy to be blocked where energy cannot go on to the machine. So it's fairly common to have a padlock on something like a, a big uh, you know, electrical switch so that the electrical switch can be locked in the off position and can't physically be turned on without the lock being removed. There are five main causes of fatal injuries. Uh, failure to stop the equipment. So if you ever worked in a machine shop, you probably had to watch a video. It may have been fairly cheesy where, you know, somebody left the chuck key in or an arm got caught in the lathe and, you know, you see the fake arm 
you know, spinning around with blood going, or fake blood obviously going everywhere. Uh, failure to stop the equipment. This is where you try to adjust the equipment while it's moving or you get your hand too close to moving equipment. So that's one cause that's common for fatalities. Another one is failure to disconnect from the power source. So uh, it's very important that when you're working on the machine that it be disconnected from the power source. You don't want to get shocked by it. You don't want the machine to move all of a sudden and impact you. There can be residual energy stored in machines. Uh, many hydraulic systems, for example, have accumulators. Or you might think of an auxiliary pneumatic tank uh, for when a compressor you know, load varies or something. Uh, failure to dissipate or uh, you know, bleed or neutralize or lock out that source of residual energy is another common cause of fatalities. Accidental restarting of the equipment. If you know someone's working on it and someone else thinks, well, I just want to move it a little bit so they turn it on, they reconnect energy and start moving and don't realize someone else is in the process of working on the equipment, that can be another cause of fatalities. Also, failure to clear the work area before you restart the equipment. So, uh, in when you're working on a machine, it's pretty common to have tools laying around, and those tools might be too close to the machine and might be slung around by the machine if the machine starts moving and restarted before the work area has been cleared out. When I was young, my mother worked at the post office, and back then, lockout, tagout wasn't a big thing, I suppose. I don't know, I was young. She told me about a story. It wasn't her, it was one of her coworkers who was working in this one unit I didn't understand it as a child that she was talking about a mail sorting machine and in my mind all I could think of was something like a big dryer you know where the mail would tumble about and I'm sure it wasn't like that but that's what I thought of well it come what ended up happening is a maintenance person was working on this machine and one of my mother's co-workers did not know it and went over and started the machine and he did make it out alive. Uh, he did have to go to the hospital, if I remember the story correctly. Fortunately, he was alive and I believe recovered, but that's, you know, uh, accidental restarting of equipment as an example. We need to define some various terms. An authorized employee is somebody uh, who locks out machines in order to perform service or maintenance or or changing and why am I talking about this because you're probably not going to be servicing equipment well you might be changing a PLC program and while you're working on a machine changing the program you may need to lock out that machine now we're not going to do that in the context of this class and each company has its own lockout procedures but you need to be aware of lockout tagout because as I said as a PLC programmer you're basically telling the machine how to direct energy and it's important that you're aware of this procedure because it is common. An effective employee is somebody whose job depends on that machine, requires them to interact or use that machine, or someone who just works in the general area where that machine is being serviced. An energy isolating device is a mechanical device that physically prevents energy from being released or transmitted. So if you look on the right, you'll see a picture of some control buttons. Those are not energy isolation devices. Just because you have an emergency stop, that is not an energy isolating device because energy isolating devices are mechanical devices that prevent energy from being transmitted. Energy control procedures are basically a safety program that the employer adopts. Uh, and it just includes the energy control procedures, how you do this, how you do all the lockout and so forth, as well as inspecting uh, inspection procedures and training for employees for lockout tagout. I know when I took a position at Grody and Madison, one of the first things they did before I could ever go into the factory was they trained me on lockout tagout because I needed to understand, even though I wasn't going to be one applying locks, they needed me to understand what it meant for there to be a lock on a machine. It meant somebody somewhere is working on that machine and we need to keep that person safe by not accidentally starting this machine or expecting to use the machine. There are many different sources of hazardous energy in the workplace. There's all kinds of things. There's categories. There's electrical, mechanical, thermal, and potential energies. Electrical is pretty obvious. You know, you don't want to stick your fingers in the 440 socket, right, or whatever you happen to have. You don't want to be shocked by electricity, but that's generated electricity. Of course, we all know about that, yet people are still shocked by it. 
Uh, but there can be static electricity as well. Static electricity is actually what commonly causes a, a big problem. If you know anything about factories that produce a lot of dust, many dusts are flammable. So sugar dust, for example, coal dust, all these things are flammable. And often what happens when you have a large explosion, a dust explosion, it's lit off by a static uh, you know, spark, not from generated electricity. So you got to be careful about all these different forms of energy because what that small spark does, that wouldn't hurt anyone if it shocks someone, but what it can do is cause a chemical reaction if we jump down to the thermal area, causes a chemical reaction where this, this fuel, this dust that acts like a fuel, starts burning and very rapidly. And so very rapidly you go from chemical energy to thermal energy, heat basically, uh, what you would normally call it, and also typically a mechanical form, basically pressure that's uh, you know pushing outward with a shock wave. Now mechanical means of uh, you know using energy can also be dangerous. A heavy crane moving along, you certainly don't want to get in the way of it. Or if you know you have something turning around, so rotational energy can be deadly. A robot that's moving around, picking things up, or welding can be deadly. That's why robots often have. Uh, light curtains around them so if a human being walks into that area then the robot senses it and automatically just stops and won't do anything. Now often robots are surrounded by cages as well so that you've got to go into the cage door and you've got sensors to detect the cage door and so forth. There's many different forms of potential energy. Pressure for example, I've already mentioned a hydraulic accumulator that can store energy. I've got a funny story on this one. I, I used to work for Amatrol and one of the products they make is a uh, hydraulics trainer. It's pretty neat because they've got all the piping laid out on a, an upright vertical board essentially and you've got some cylinders, you've got a pump, you've got a reservoir, you've got a hydraulic accumulator and a hydraulic accumulator is kind of interesting because it's basically just a, a relatively small vessel where you can compress a spring or perhaps it's a gas, but it compresses it quite a bit. I think it's actually a mechanical spring because it needs a very high spring constant. And basically you just push a little bit of fluid in and what this does is it kind of levels out the, the pumps variation. A lot of pumps have you know pressure spikes as they turn and so the accumulator can level things out. It can also provide a little bit of power if the, the pump needs just a little bit of extra every now and then. So this hydraulic accumulator, if you know anything about thermodynamics, you know that when you transform energy, the, you, you lose a little bit. And it's not that it's destroyed, it's that energy seems to like to naturally convert into thermal energy, or what you would call heat. And so when you charge an accumulator, it usually warms up. And part of the reason is because the oil's warm, but the other part of the reason is because, again, the, the energy that goes in, some of it changes to thermal energy. So my, my manager at the time was working with a technical writer, and he wasn't thinking. The, the system had just ran, and he reached up and he touched the accumulator, and it was pretty hot. So he touches it and he goes, ah, that's hot. And the, the technical writer, not thinking, just responding, I guess didn't believe him. And he reached up and touched it and hit, burned his hand and said, oh, you're right. So it was just this funny story we always told about how, you know, <laughs> you see someone get hurt, and yet you end up following in their footsteps and being hurt as well. So be careful about that. Be careful about you know, jumping off the bridge with everybody else. So anyway, and obviously pneumatic systems can contain pressure and that's a, a potential source of energy. And even vacuum systems though have the potential to do work. And so they store energy as well. Springs are an obvious source of stored energy. Uh, potential energy where, you know, gravitation is acting on a heavy weight. Uh, that's another source. So when you have a PLC shut down, you have to think about how it should shut down in a safe way. Do you want it to bleed off energy or do you want it to hold that energy when it shuts down? It's really important to think about these things. But it's also important when working on a piece of equipment to be aware of all these forms of energy and how you prevent any of those forms from being transmitted to your body and basically breaking you apart or causing burns or whatever. There are many different types of lockout devices. I'm going to show you a few, but there's many more in industry. There are plug locks that are just clam shells that you close over and you can lock them. Those are a pretty simple device. Here's a ball 
uh, well, a, a ball valve lockout is something that is available. I don't have a picture of one. A ball valve is a little different. Usually there's a handle, you just turn it 90 degrees. A gate valve usually has a, a wheel that you can turn multiple rotations to move the gate up and down. So here's a picture of a gate valve lockout. and All it really is is a piece of plastic, a clamshell again, that clamps around the, the wheel so that you can't turn it. You can't get a grip on it. Kind of like a, a child's safety lock on a pill bottle. Okay. A lot of times multiple people have to work on a given machine. You have more than one person servicing or maintaining or repairing it. And so again frequently the lockout ability that's provided for the machine just has room for one lock and so there are also group lockout hasps that you put on in place of a single lock and now you've got six different places to apply locks and if you need more just add more hasps into one of the locations you can daisy chain these essentially so here's a picture of an electrical switch where there's a hasp on it to prevent the switch from being thrown and power from being passed on to the machine and you can see multiple uh, padlocks on that hasp to prevent the machine from being uh, activated, but more precisely to protect the workers who are working on that machine. There are lockout devices for hydraulic systems, for pneumatic systems, and here's a couple of examples. The one in the lower right is one that I actually used. It was one that I specified for a machine I was working on. It's a combination thing it actually has a solenoid valve that you can turn on and off and it's for pneumatic system so where your your main air pressure supply comes into the machine you can barely see it there there's sort of a yellow tab you see off to the right more and off to the left that was actually a switch that you could slide back and forth and when you slid it into one direction into the off position there was actually a hole you can't see it, it comes in from the top and you would put your lock or your hasp there to prevent that switch from being moved and therefore air could not pass onto the machine even if the solenoid was activated. There are other examples there of pneumatic hose lockouts. Most of them uh, involve putting the hose into a device and then locking it out. There are some more you know, general devices that are clamshell or box approaches where you can put you know, connections for energy. Uh, probably not hydraulic, that would be a mess, although I suppose you could. Typically pneumatic and electrical uh, or what you would use here and you can see on the front of the box it's pretty small but you can see there where the two pieces come together and there are multiple holes for putting locks on and there are other, many other types of devices for other pressurized systems and other uh, types of energy containment systems tag out is a little different than lockout but it is addressed in the standard so we will talk about it here tags are only warning devices they do not isolate energy they don't mechanically prevent the transmission of energy therefore they have to be respected when you see a tag you can't just ignore it you have to assume that it means something and you don't want to operate the machine because you don't want anyone to get hurt thereby the, the tag has to be legible you know if you can't read it you can't tell what it's saying and so therefore it must also not deteriorate because of the local environment if you got you know a, a fog or you've got you know a lower a high temperature or maybe an environment that's very corrosive you need to make sure the tag is compatible with that environment and won't deteriorate over time in that environment another thing that's very important is that the the style of the tag has to be standardized if you go from the state you live in to another you probably recognize the stop signs immediately because they look the same in every state now there seems to be a little bit of variation between the way that stop lights or traffic signals are set up and so you know you might have a little bit of trouble initially driving in other states until you kind of get used to their particular flavor but things are standardized enough that just looking at something you can recognize what it is it's important that tags are the same way and you see a very typical uh, look of a tag here in this uh, photo there has to be some lockout procedure and lockout procedures vary by company but basically they involve these steps at a minimum and this is from the standard the number one step is to alert affected employees that power is being disconnected and that lockout or tag out is going to be applied the next step is to shut down equipment often you know you you might think that you you know all injection molding machines or industrial equipment you could just 
turn it off, kind of like you do a key in your car's ignition. But that's not the way it really is. Uh, things like large uh, power plants, for example, these are big machines. You can't just turn them off with a flick of a switch. In fact, you can't turn them on with a flick of a switch either. Often, coal-fired power plants, for example, or nuclear power plants, take at least a day to get up to speed or take a day to shut all the way down. And so it's very important to shut down equipment by a procedure because if you take an injection molding machine that has plastic in the, the hopper and in the sprue and you just shut it down, well, that plastic's going to solidify and getting that machine going again can be quite difficult. It's important then to operate the equipment isolation controls. And what that really means is, you know, if you think about a, uh, an electrical box where you're going to put your your lock, it's important to shut off the switch. That's what that really means. And then step four is to apply the lockout device. Apply your, your lock to it. Step five is to get rid of any uh, stored energy, anything that's left behind in the machine. Uh, in a, the case of an injection molding machine, this might be waiting long enough for it to cool down so you don't get burned. In the case of a hydraulic system, it might be bleeding the accumulator. And step six is to finally try to operate the equipment is essentially by pressing the start button to see if it's de-energized, see if it will move at all. And if it doesn't move, then you know everything's okay. So you got to test it to make sure that you've been successful at removing energy and dissipating stored energy. Sometimes equipment has to be temporarily reactivated. If you're working on a crane, for example, and the crane needs to be moved a little bit so that you can access some other part of it. Uh, then there has to be some procedure for reactivating the equipment. The first step is to remove any unnecessary items from the work area and make sure everybody's out of the way. You don't want to have a surprise where the equipment runs into something. The machine's dumb, right? It's not going to know. You have to be the human, intelligent, and know. Finally, remove employees from the machine or the equipment area. So get people out of the way so the, the first step is a little bit different because the first step is kind of like, okay, Joe's at the other end of the equipment underneath it working on it. You've got to make sure he, he's clear of it. He's not going to be hit by it. Okay? The other part is there might be employees that are you know, looking on to see what's happening because their job is affected by it. You need them out of the way as well. So that's why there's a separate step here. Step three is to remove the lockout or tagout device in accordance with procedures, whatever those may be at your company, and then re-energize the system, basically apply power to it so that you can then test and position. And as soon as the energy is no longer needed, then go through the entire process of locking out the or tagging out the equipment again in the six step procedure from before. When the servicing or maintenance or repair is finally completed, then the lock can be removed. Again, there's a procedure here to make sure that nobody gets hurt. Number one is kind of like when you reactivate. In fact, this list is almost identical to the reactivation list where you remove tools and non-essential items. You ensure that the equipment is operationally intact. So you're making sure that it's ready to go, that everything's buttoned up and you don't have a pile of screws left over or something. Ensure that everybody's out of the way, right? So that if something does go wrong when you apply power, nobody gets hurt. Remove the lockout tagout device. And in removing these devices, it's very important that the person who put the lock on be the person who removed it or put the tag on. Because that person needs to know that energy is now available to that machine so they don't just make the assumption that their tag or lock is still there and they can safely go work on the machine. Finally, once it's ready to go, then notify employees that it's ready to be used again. It's fixed. It's ready to go. There are some special situations. Sometimes servicing a machine lasts longer than one shift. So how do you make sure there's a handoff of safety from one group to the next? What you need is some overlap in time so that the incoming shift can apply their locks while the outgoing shift removes their locks by procedure. Sometimes you hire people to come in and take care of equipment problems, and so those are contractors typically that either are repairing or, or building or maintaining a piece of equipment. And so that's a different situation as well. Sometimes the worker who applied the lock is not available. So what do you do then? Well, in the case where a worker 
who applied the lock is not available, maybe they got sick while they were working on the machine. The first step, there has to be a procedure here too. You got to make sure that that person is not at the facility, so they're not available to remove their lock. And you've got to make sure that all reasonable efforts have been made to contact that employee and make sure they know that their lockout or tagout was removed. And then finally, when that person comes back to the facility, they have to be made aware that it was removed before they can continue and resume work at the facility. They can't be allowed out into the plant until they know that that lock they put on and then got sick had been cut off with bolt cutters or something. Okay. When contractors are performing maintenance, you have to make sure they are aware of your own procedures. Often contractors have their own procedures too that they will want to share because they're specialized in one area and they know what you know accidents have ha happened in the past. And so often there's a, there's a conversation that needs to happen between the contractor and the company to make sure everybody knows how to stay safe. Here's a few more little pieces of information. You should never attempt lockout tagout unless you've been trained and certified by your employer under an approved program. Okay. You should never loan your lock to someone else. You should never give anyone else your key. You should never give them your combination if that's the type of lock you use. Your lock is for your protection and your protection only. And the only way to ensure it protects you is that if you're the one that applies it and removes it. You also want to make sure that your lock will work in the environment it's in. You don't want to use a lock that rusts off in five minutes because it's a corrosive environment, you know, or it's a humid environment and so your lock gets damaged and you can no longer use it. You want to make sure that it's compatible with the local environment in which it'll be used. Now all of these pieces of information, this is just a brief introduction to lockout tagout. When you go to work for an employer, they will have their own take on this. It'll be based on this standard, and so a lot of this will sound very familiar, but they will be more familiar with what particular hazards there are in their workplace that are the most common. For example, again, when I worked for Grody, they had a lot of stamping machines. And when I went and visited Trihawk Automotive in um, up 65, I can't remember where they're at, but they have tons of staff, uh, you know, uh, stamping machines that are not just stamping little connectors like we were doing at Grody. These are stamping out sheet metal parts for car frames and bodies. So obviously, there's different levels of danger. Even the, the stamping machines at Grody could easily take a hand off. And so you want to be able to control energy and know where there is dangerous energy in the plant and be able to protect against it.